Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha, a very good evening and warm welcome to one and all. I welcome you on behalf of Ayurveda Map to today's session of Superva, Sessions on Management of Joint Disorders and Pain Management in Ayurveda. Today, topic of discussion is Neck and Shoulder Joint Pathologies and its Management. And today our speaker is one of the very eminent and uh, stalwarts of Ayurveda. He's a very famous personality in the Ayurveda fraternity and among students. It is Dr. Murli Dar Sharma, sir. He's Professor Emeritus, Department of Shalya Tantra, STM College of Ayurveda, Udupi. Little bit about our uh, speaker today. So, sir completed his BSAM from Mysore University in 1980. He completed his MD in Shalya Tantra from Banaras Hindu University in 1983. He has been teaching uh, Ayurveda since 1983 uh, until 2018. He has been guiding various Ayurveda students and PG scholars and also interns. He, he has been sharing the institution responsibility of STM Ayurveda College as Professor Emeritus. He has published various scientific papers and delivers various talks in different national and international platforms. It's a honor for us to have you in today's session, sir. Uh, I once again welcome you uh, on behalf of Dr. Jasul and Ayurveda Ma. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. I hope the screen is visible. Visible, sir. Okay, fine. So, thank you for the offer. Now, let me start with the topic directly. The topic is clinical conditions related to shoulder and neck joints. I have besides Ayurvedic practice, so I will not go much into the detail of the other aspects as such. Now, shoulder joint as such. We start with the shoulder joint. Shoulder joint as such is a unique joint in the sense it has a maximum range of the movement but at the same time, it is also highly unstable. The structure of the shoulder joint also is very complex because there is virtually, it is not a single joint. It is actually a combination of more, around five joints and the major important joints which give the support to the shoulder and actually shoulder is not related, directly adhered to the body, rather it is slightly away from the body, it is free from the body, the core part of the body. But it is almost connected to the body through a various set of sequence of the joints and the joints which take part in the stability of the shoulder joint are sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint and that glenohumeral joint which is we consider as a major joint as such. But these joints again are having a unique structural entity like the rotator cuff muscles which are really the supporting muscles and the glenohumeral ligaments and transverse uh, uh, humeral ligaments, coracacromial ligaments, all these really form that complex structure of the joints. Very brief about the anatomy, I will not go into much detail about the anatomy as such. The sternoclavicular joint which is the fundamental joint which actually supports the shoulder joint from a distance and gives a connection. The basic connection between the axial skeleton and the shoulder joint, the only bone connection is the clavicle. And the sternoclavicular joint actually allows around 30 to 35 degrees of upward elevation or hinging of the shoulder movement and around 30 degree of anterior posterior movement and around 44 to 50 degrees of rotation about the long axis of the clavicle in case in the shoulder joint. Whereas the acromioclavicular joint again which is also a very unique joint in the sense it is the only articulation which is between the clavicle and the scapula. Scapula, the whole shoulder blade or which we call as amsafalaka in Sushutra, that amsafalaka or the shoulder scapula is connected to the clavicle through the acromioclavicular joint and this joint also is a, a unique joint in the sense the ligaments which form or which support the joint one, the acromioclavicular joint, of course, is as usual any other joints, like it makes a fibrous joint. But the other two critical joints, the uh, critical ligaments, which support the joint, the deltoid and the coronoid joint or coronoid ligaments, they are actually away from the joints and they support the joint from a, a distance. And because of this, they, the whole uh, uh, joint also becomes somewhat unstable. 
though it's a fibrous joint, it allows for a certain amount of the movement over the area and it gives support to the shoulder. See, it holds the humerus from the superior side, prevents the uh, humerus from slipping up from the superior side and virtually there is not much of a, a range of movement at the acromacular joint, though it allows a huge range of movement in the shoulder joint as such. The glenohumeral joint, which is the main, the main part of the shoulder joint, is uh, a, actually uh, it's uh, often classified as a ball and socket, but virtually it's not a socket, it's a ball and plate. That glenoid surface is a relatively flat surface and the ball, the head of the humerus, uh, which is located almost in a floating manner and it's supported by the bursae around. And though it gives a huge range of movement, the maximum range of movement is seen in the shoulder joint, but it's uh, unstable, structurally unstable. And the glenoid labrum, that uh, the glenoid surface, has uh, a fibrinous and ligament uh, surrounding area, which gives that support to the joint, that glenoid labrum, that uh, lip-like structure of the ligament, uh, these, uh, sorry, cartilages around and the fibrous tissue, fibrous and the cartilaginous tissue gives the support to the joint and the stability of the shoulder joint is dependent upon this glenoid labrum which is around 2.5 mm thick as such. And uh, the uh, glenoid labrum adds to that uh, fibrous joint, adds to the depth of the joint and makes it as a socket. But virtually, uh, if you consider the bony surface, it's not really a socket. So, socket-like shape is created by the fibrous uh, substance around the area, which we call as a glenoid labrum. Then, the whole support, the strength of the shoulder joint is dependent on the rotator cuff. The, it's a combination of uh, muscles, which uh, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor and subscapularis muscles, all of them together, they give that support to the joint and because of these muscles, the joint becomes stable and this is one of the important structural entity which gives stability to the joint and important in study, understanding the lesions related to the shoulder joint. The important muscles and their origin, like conventional uh, anatomy point of view, supraspinatus origin from the, of course, uh, from the clinical point of view, uh, it's also important. I don't say that it's not important, but often the people do not bother about this. But the point which you have to note is from the clinical point is the range of movement created by individual muscles, the actions as such. Supraspinatus, it helps in abduction of the arms up to about 30 degree. Infraspinatus, it gives an external rotation to the arm, supports the external rotation of the arm. Teres minor also is external rotation of the arm, takes part in the external rotation of the arm. And subscapularis is uh, mainly for the internal rotation of the arm. The nerves which supply these also, suprascapular nerves supply the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles, axillary nerve, the teres minor, and the subscapular nerves again to the subscapular muscles as well. Then subacromial bursa, another important structure which gives stability to the joint as well as has a role to play with many of the clinical conditions related to the shoulder joint. Are, it's a, a huge bursa, a, 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 this buffer-like structure, a bag as such, like it acts as a cushion to reduce the friction between the bones as well as the ligaments during the movement and these also have a significant role to play and one of the big, uh, huge bursa, of course, it's not the biggest bursa, but one of the huge big bursa in the human body and has a role to play in the pathology of the joints as such. With this, the very brief about the basic anatomy, we will directly go into certain of the common lesions which we see in the clinical practice. To list about all the conditions related to a joint is virtually not possible in a limited time interval. So, I will try to pick up a few of the conditions which we may see quite frequently in the clinical practice and moreover, uh, where we have a, a, a rather a scope for dealing with in a limited facility of clinical practice as such. Now, among, the among those conditions which we see quite frequently with the, the trauma, induced trauma around the shoulder and in the body, clavicle fracture is one quite frequent, I don't say it's one of the most common, but it's a quite frequent entity, the clavicular fracture. 
The type of the trauma which produces a clavicular fracture could be a direct trauma which is hitting over the uh, blade of the shoulder or the tip of the shoulder or it also can occur due to an indirect trauma where the shoulder is overstretched like and uh, uh, the fracture lines would be at any part of the uh, clavicle part. The most common site where the fracture would occur would be in the middle, mid, uh, mid part of the clavicle which constitutes around 80 percent and on the uh, medial side comparatively the incidence is lesser, lateral part is around 15 percent. The issues, clinical symptoms and the complications would be very serious complications can occur in case of the medial one third of the clavicle fracture because it is very close to the deeper structure like uh, the pleura as well as the neck vessels. So, Almost every fracture related to the medial one third of the clavicle, it requires a multidisciplinary intervention and it is often a, a, it produces certain serious complications which are because of the, uh, the involvement of the internal structures. So, they cannot be casually taken and uh, they, uh, you, they cannot be handled in a, a simple clinical situation as it, it requires more specialized intervention. Now, from the clinical point of view, the fractures are classified mainly based upon this location of the fracture and uh, uh, compared to the medial side, the fractures of the middle and lateral one thirds would have a better prognosis. Symptoms also would be relatively simpler. Clinical diagnosis of these also is relatively easier because the more major part of these the lateral one third and the medial two th uh, one third would be almost subcutaneous and hence the fracture line will be visible, bulging will be seen. And in almost every condition, now for the fract fracture of the clavicle and the medial one third and the uh, middle one third, sorry, lateral one third and the mid uh, middle one third, simple immobilization techniques would be enough. Uh, even if the reduction is not absolutely correct, a marginal defect could be left over. But immobilization with a simple figure of eight bandage or now these days you have different sorts of these uh, braces and supports for the clavicular fracture uh, and uh, of course uh, the, I will not go into the details of each of these types of the supports but any of these could be used based upon the convenient and the most important part is uh, the immobilization and uh, the results would be quite good. Uh, a simple management with the, a brace or a moderate support. Different sort of the supports are now available. Simplest is the figure of eight or maybe the virtual wrap as such which is often seen uh, quite frequently and these are the simple methods of intervention which can almost treat the conditions. Sushuna has referred to the condition of fractures of uh, clavicle as Akshakasi Bhagna and the treatment suggested is Sannam Unnamayat Srinam Akshakam Sarenato Tatha Unnatam Pirecha Bhagniyat Gadhmeyavacha that uh, Akshakasi the lateral part has to be elevated uh, by a rod or some other support in between and then has to be put in a tight bandage. But all these are true only in case of uh, fractures of the lateral one third or middle one third. Medial one third of the clavicle, when that it has a fracture, it requires more sophisticated investigation and the intervention also should be more sophisticated. Most of the times there will be some other accompanied complications and it is always a multidisciplinary approach which is required. So, from a general clinical practice point of view, medial one third fracture of the clavicle is beyond the scope of a general practice. Whereas lateral one third and the middle one third usually can be easily cured. Now another option now what happens is that in this fracture conditions union with the simple immobilization is often good enough but there could be some situations where either there could be open injury or there could be a, due to the cosmetic purposes you may require a surgical intervention. Now Sushuna has given another option of a uh, the fracture bed, a fracture bed is uh, uh, applied, uh, prepared in Sushuna where it could be immobilized as in where you have some supports across the joints 
which are just or maybe rivets uh, over the bed and they are used for the support which is also the fractured bed is another of the option. From the current point of view, surgical interventions may be needed even in case of the fracture of the lateral one third or the middle one third if there is a huge displacement and causing a, either a huge denting of the skin or penetration fracture or as such or a fracture which has resulted in a huge shortening of more than 2 cm or around 2 cm as such. Comminuted fractures where there could be a Z-shaped fracture segment which also could be an indication for surgery even if it is a medial, uh, middle one third or lateral one third. Medial one third invariably it requires a surgical intervention in general. If there is a neurovascular compromise, if there is a damage to the nerves, very rarely it can occur if there is a huge or a powerful trauma or if the clavicular fractures are displaced and with the, uh, uh, it could be like penetrating in rarely which also can occur, multiple fractures or open fractures they require surgical intervention as such and if there is a established non-union if uh, it has failed to produce a union as such or if there is a, a corresponding glenoid neck fracture that gland or floating shoulder shoulder joint also is in the other conditions but luckily from the clinical point of view such a complications are lesser so real need for surgical intervention in case of the fractures of the lateral one third of clavicle are very rare and of course, the another is a cosmetic purpose. Cosmetic purpose, sorry, there is a spelling error, it's a complication of cosmetic, cosmetic purpose. Of course, uh, that's the other way. A cosmetic purpose, every case of fracture of the clavicle may be required to be treated surgically. That's one of the common conditions. Next very common condition would be the glenohumeral dislocation or the real shoulder joint dislocation, which occurs quite frequently. And it's supposed to be among the all the dislocations that we see in the clinical practice. It is supposed to be almost uh, uh, the fifty percent of all the major joint dislocations are the glenohumeral dislocation. And this dislocation is classified into five categories, uh, uh, four categories, as either anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation or subluxation, and then rarely the central dislocation. What we mean by this is uh, anterior dislocation is uh, when the head of the humerus is displaced towards the anterior side, posterior is displaced towards the posterior and uh, the inferior is the subluxation where it is really hanging in. Central is the head of the femur, head of the humerus penetrates into the glenoid surface and produces a fracture within the joint space and this would have that central dislocation would have the worst prognosis. And, but luckily it is less than 1%. Majority of the patients whom we see would be the anterior dislocations which we see quite frequently in the clinical practice. The, um, the shoulder joint lesions are uh, difficult to be made out clinically because uh, the clinical examination signs are lesser. So imaging is uh, quite important. Even with the imaging, uh, most of the times uh, the reading of the X-rays would be depending upon a perfect positioning of the patient. If the position is not done, a simple casual x-ray, an error by a, the x-ray technician often may result in confusion and it may not be possible to make out. So classically for a shoulder joint dislocation, you need the classical views of either AP view and in the AP view the image would be, you can make out the gap between the mainly the surfaces of the glenoid and the humerus as well as the superior, the acromioclavicular joint and the uh, head of the humerus. At the same time, another of the important is uh, the axillary view, very critical in case of the dislocation. The axillary view, the space between the glenoid surface and uh, the head of the humerus and its orientation can be made out. It should be essential in a suspected shoulder dislocation, axillary view x-ray is essential and the position in which the x-ray has to be taken, this is exactly how it has to be taken. And another of the very significant uh, uh, issue 
is the Y view or anterolateral view. Anterolateral view where the gap between the scapula and the thoracic surface can be made out and these all the three views are essential to confirm a dislocation. Without that simply looking at a conventional AP view often can produce some confusion. Now in certain cases, rare cases, another view like a right oblique view or right LP view also may be necessary where the patient is a kept in a somewhat oblique view and the x-rays are passed through the joint which helps in uh, making out of the uh, horizontal section or horizontal gap between the uh, glenoid and uh, the humeral surface. This position may not be required in all patients but the other three positions are absolutely important in the uh, uh, suspected dislocation of acid. Now a clinical presentation of the anterior dislocation, the radiological presentation would be you can make out the position of the head of the humerus as you see in the AP view the head of the humerus is presented in the anterior side when you see in the Y view that uh, the gap between the scapula and the thoracic cage can be easily made out and so plain x-ray is often good enough but if you go for the CT scan or MRI you can make out the position of the muscles and the possible tear of the muscles also can be made out clinical signs the important is uh, Majority of these anterior dislocation can be easily diagnosed clinically, whereas a posterior dislocation may not be easily diagnosed as such. You will have some uh, masking of the clinical signs. The clinical signs are pri primarily when you look at the position of the uh, shoulder, it quite looks like the arms are held in slightly abduction and external rotation position, and the shoulder looks like as if it is squared off or it looks like a box like and the deltoid counter that convex surface over the deltoid area seems to be reduced or maybe flattened over the area as such. Humeral head is palpable anteriorly and the subcoracoid region below the coracoid process beneath the clavicle it can be felt if you palpate area. Yeah. And abduction and internal rotation is not possible. A patient cannot touch the opposite shoulder. One of the important issues in all cases of shoulder dislocation is essential though you, you may make the diagnosis of a shoulder dislocation comparatively easily, anterior dislocation can be comparatively easily but essential is to confirm whether there is a impairment of the blood supply if the brachial vessels or the brachial nerves are injured or not. Though the incidence of that is comparatively lesser but still it is quite essential to confirm that and this has to be done by feeling the radial pulses and a, a vascular injury, a injury to the blood vessels is a emergency condition which requires immediate surgical intervention and uh, uh, though the incidence is less common, it is quite essential that every patient you have to rule out that possibility and if the axillary nerve is uh, damaged, there could be an impairment of the sensation, there could be a pin prick sensation over the area of the deltoid area uh, as such. So sensory and motor functions of the radial nerves also have to be examined in every patient to rule out. In these cases where there is either a blood vessel injury or a nerve injury, a essential immediate surgical intervention is necessary. Without that, there could be later complications. Otherwise, the clinical presentation of an anterior dislocation of the shoulder gives you that typical box drop or square drop appearance of the shoulder shoulder is held in a slight abduction position, adduction is uh, patient prevents abduction as such and uh, the position is quite obvious, the diagnosis is uh, quite obvious by looking at the position of uh, the shoulder in case of the anterior dislocation. Whereas with the posterior dislocation, incident is less common, 85% of the patients are uh, the anterior dislocation. So in the posterior dislocation, you will see that in the plain x-ray, the head of the humerus would show a typical bulging which is often said as electrical bulb or light bulb like appearance that the convexity seems to be you know, quite smooth surface the tubercles would not be seen clearly and uh, the CT or MRI can show you that whether it is a penetration of the subscapular muscle one of the major issue in case of the posterior dislocation would be uh, the head of the humerus may penetrate into the muscles and in that condition the reduction would be difficult. Clinical signs are arm is held in adduction and slightly internal rotation. 
The anterior shoulder, of course, shows a square of position, but not as flat as that of uh, the anterior uh, dislocation. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, posterior shoulder is a full posterior surface. You will show a bulging with the femoral head, which is palpable. Patient resists external rotation, and neurovascular deficits are less frequent, unlike that of the anterior dislocation. Complications of the neurovascular issues are compared lesser. Typical clinical appearance in case of the posterior dislocation that bulge on the posterior side, when you look at from the lateral view or from the lateral side, side to side, this bulging on the posterior side can be made out. But if you look from the front, you may not make out that difference. So, in a patient of a shoulder dislocation, you have to observe the patient both from anterior side, from the side, uh, side to side, lateral side, as well as the posterior view. All these three views you have to look at. I am not su suggesting of the radiological position. Clinical examination is necessary and in this position you can see the bulging on the posterior side which makes the diagnosis easier. Otherwise, the other clinical signs which are apparently visible in case of the posterior dislocation are less as such. The subluxation or inferior dislocation is comparatively less frequent which often occurs due to an extreme uh, trauma, very powerful trauma and the shoulder is stretched out, usually when the shoulder is pulled off from a distance and a sort of indirect trauma, that produces the dislocation and in that condition, the uh, head of the humerus will be palpable in the axilla and in the x-ray, that gap is easily made out as such. The position in that condition, the patient would be keeping the arm abducted and usually the patient keeps the arm up, flexed up and uh, uh, maybe on the superior side, he keeps the asset and in the axilla, humeral head is palpable and that makes the diagnosis of um, the inferior dislocation or um, the subluxation. Almost uh, 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 every patient of uh, shoulder dislocation uh, can be managed conservatively in the absence of uh, neurovascular injury. If we have ruled out neurovascular injury, uh, the reduction and immobilization is uh, relatively simpler in shoulder dislocation. But the risk of uh, recurrent dislocation always exists in case of the shoulder dislocation. I will come to that part. But primarily clinical point of view, shoulder dislocation can be reduced to comparatively easily. And there are many methods. If you look at the textbooks, you will find many methods as such. And many practitioners prefer different sorts of the methods. The most common and I would consider safest method is the caucus method. The caucus method, the first is you have to give a traction in the long axis of the humerus holding the elbow at right angle and then you adduct the shoulder as well as an external rotation is done, the shoulder is externally rotated, keeping that stretch on, you bring the palm towards the opposite side and that helps in reduction. During this movement, there will be clicking movement and the shoulder gets reduced. So, almost every patient can be easily managed uh, with a mild relaxation of the muscle. You may not require a general anesthesia in majority of the conditions. Except any of you, you may require anesthesia if the patient is not cooperative. Otherwise, the reduction can be simply done. And after the reduction, the patient, the immobilization also is done simply either a simple splint or a, maybe a supportive bandage which can be easily arranged. Now the other methods which you can see are, which are often used maybe some physicians may prefer any of these positions. Rarely you may have to modify from the caucus method but in all the methods the important issue the gap between the shoulder and the chest has to be widened or increased by different method. When you keep a, a soft cloth or some other issue in the axilla and then pull out that is called as hippocratic method. In, if you use a make, make use of the support of the chair that is called as chair method or Simpson hanging arm method where the patient is nursed in a, a supine position with the uh, hang, arm hanging with some weight or spasm method where it is stretched up and so on or it could be like a self reduction also can be achieved or it could be like uh, the Eskimo hanging method. So, there are lots of uh, methods of reduction of the shoulder joint which are adopted, but I would still consider caucus method as the safest. Sushila has mentioned almost a similar technique and the basic principle there in case of the shoulder dislocation is uh, 
to widen the gap or give a support in the axilla and then into this uh, adduct the shoulder. Now, to widen that support, Sushita has used a pounding rod that is Musalena Utshibe Kaksham Mantasandha Usamhade Sthana Sthidam Debadnyat Sushikena Tekshanaha Yes, Sushikvanda is applied after reducing by keeping a rigid object in the axilla and the support is achieved. Then, the most of the patients of shoulder joint dislocation uh, they would uh, recover, but most of the times there will be some rigidity. So, most of these patients they require a maybe rehabilitation or maybe exercise later. And uh, the simplest exercise is what we call as a range of movement exercise and, uh, for the rehabilitation, which may be required for about two to three months uh, many a times. See, immobilization is for only three weeks in general. But later for the recovery of the movement, you have to suggest about the exercises. Of course, again, there will be different sorts of the exercises. Best of the simplest exercise would be you make use of the isometric exercise where the patient is made to stand in front of a wall and then put a pressure keeping the elbow at right angle, gradually raise up the arm and maybe give a support. This is how it is done and gradually you extend the range of movements and then extend the shoulder. Recurrent dislocation is uh, quite frequent. As per the data statistics, recurrent dislocations are almost 100% in a dislocation occurring at N age in between 1 to 10 years. And uh, as the age passes, as such, in the later half, uh, half of the life, the incidence of the recurrence is comparatively lesser. So, in uh, older patients like 41 to 50 years age, recurrence rate reduces to 0 to 24 percent comparatively, whereas in between 1 to 10 years it is almost 100 percent, so recurrence is quite common. And uh, uh, the other way the percentage gradually reduces as the age increases as such. This is about the statistical incidence, but important is recurrence has uh, almost the major cause of the recurrence is uh, a underlying fracture which we call as the Bankart fracture, some uh, residual uh, lesion of the joint as such. As far as the, uh, uh, the anatomical consideration, these fracture in injuries are again categorized into different categories, either Bankart or Pertis and uh, maybe the osseous Bankart or Brewer's Bankart where the location of the injury is important. Of course, these classifications and the study are important from the uh, surgical point of view. The, and one of the important is that majority of these conditions they cannot be made out in the brain x-ray. Only MRI scan can make out and the uh, now the general trend in the handling of shoulder dislocation is gradually changing. The current generation of orthopedicians would say that every case of shoulder dislocation has to be subjected to MRI scan in the beginning and that uh, possibility of bankrupt, uh, bankrupt injury has to be confirmed and they suggest a surgical treatment in the beginning than really trying the conservative treatment. But the established norms of uh, the orthopedic practice is that uh, you try a conservative treatment and then see the results. MRI scan is done only if the patient shows a sign of uh, recurrence and you, then you may identify any of these features and then suggest a surgery. So, if there are any bankart injury seen in the MRI, this is the other way so from the clinical point of view, both these versions are there. Some of the new generation orthopedics would, orthopedicians would say that it should be, MRI should be done in the beginning and then a surgical intervention is preferable. But uh, the other way, the norm also is universally acceptable, like you try with the conservative treatment and if there is a complication, go for the MRI scan and then you identify any of these uh, injuries and in such conditions, surgical treatment would be necessary. Recurrent dislocation as such, it requires surgery. A medical treatment would be virtually not possible. If the recurrence has occurred more than three times, if more than three recurrences, essentially surgical has be, treatment is done. So, that is in brief about the glenohumeral dislocation. Another of the joint injury which we see quite frequently is acromioclacular joint injury the superior acromioclacular joint asset. Approximately about 12% of our dislocations involving the shoulder affect the acromioclacular joint. 
So what happens is when you look at the shoulder joint dislocation clinically in the beginning, all your focus would be at the glenohumeral joint and uh, the management is done as we have discussed. The acromioclacular joint dislocation either is not noticed or what happens is because of the ligament injuries, the ligaments they may not give away immediately after the trauma. There could be a trauma and the ligaments, particularly the deltoid and conoid ligament may be injured but they may not give away at the time of the trauma. But in due course of time, there could be a vascularity and gradually these ligaments give away. So many times the signs of acromioclacular joint dislocation would occur much later after two or three weeks or maybe at times even after a few months or when the patient is mobilized, rehabilitated from a shoulder joint dislocation, the acromioclacular joint injury can be evident. This is again a comparatively quite frequent incidence in the clinical practice. And it, uh, usually if the patient is uh, having an injury of the shoulder joint due to a direct trauma or fallen outstretched hand, the chances of oh, acromioclacular joint injury are uh, more. The, from the clinical point of view, the acromioclacular joint injuries are categorized into six categories. The important is uh, uh, the categorization is essential or uh, assessment of these categories is essential from the clinical point of view to decide about whether the patient can be managed conservatively or whether the patient requires a surgical intervention. The categories of type 1 to type 3, they can be managed conservatively, whereas injuries of type 4 to type 6, they require a surgical intervention. The type 1 is where there could be a minor sprain of the acromioclacular joint and there are no other clinical signs, the ligaments are intact. The coracoclavicular and deltoid and trapezius, uh, all these ligaments are intact. Only there could be main tenderness and sprain, so if you palpate, you may feel the tenderness, but there may not be a gap. Type 2 is a rupture of the acromioclavicular ligament and the joint capsule, only that acromioclavicular joint has given away. But the other ligaments are intact, particularly deltoid and conoid ligaments are intact, that's type 2. Type 3 is where there is a acromioclavicular ligament is involved and joint capsule is involved and the clavicle is some, somewhat elevated, the gap is quite felt, usually a step ladder like feeling is felt when you palpate over the area and up to this level a conservative management is possible. But if there is a rupture of the acromioclavicular ligament along with the deltoid ligament also and the clavicle is displaced posteriorly, that's type 4 or rupture of the acromial ligament and there is a huge displacement of the calf, uh, clavicle which is elevated as well as posteriorly displaced and type 6 is compared to that where there is a complete rupture of all the ligaments together and uh, maybe a huge gap is formed. These three conditions require a surgical intervention and cannot be managed medically and hence whenever a patient comes with acromioclavicular dislocation, correct assessment is necessary. Suppose you identify that this is a, uh, in the conservative management level, the treatment is relatively simple. The uh, support which gives uh, or reduces the mobility of uh, the acromioclavicular joint, where the shoulder is, uh, elbow is supported and the shoulder also is supported by a support uh, extending towards the opposite side is done weight bearing on the shoulder is reduced, this would be enough in the, those conditions which, we, which can be managed with the conservative type 1 to type 3. Whereas uh, the mm -hmm. uh, other conditions require surgical intervention. The most common complications of the acromioclacular dislocation are either there is a cosmetic deformity or most of the times uh, the osteoarthrosis changes, they would occur rapidly. Most of these conditions, particularly in the village folk, where they may not go for immediate medical attention, the initial shoulder joint may be somehow managed, shoulder joint injury may be somehow managed. The patients develop the symptoms of pain in the shoulder joint or acromioclacular joint much later, and they come only in the later phases where the patient may have even uh, the clavicle osteolysis, the clavicle may become completely uh, reduced and the shoulder range of movement and upper extremity strength could reduce which often mimics that of the shoulder rotator cuff injury 
in such condition so clinical differentiation would be necessary but once it is late then the surgical intervention also may not produce su sufficient clinical results so important is discretion is necessary as such that's about the major trauma induced conditions which we may see clinically but beyond that direct trauma and the fresh trauma conditions the other uh, pa uh, among a large number of patients who present with the shoulder joint pathology there could be mainly the pain around the shoulder joint and a sort of uh, impaired movements as such. Now, of course, a huge number of diseases will present with the pain in the shoulder joint and a clinical assessment, exact clinical assessment of these conditions also is a very elaborate issue. So, to refer to all that differential diagnosis conditions would be quite difficult in that time limit condition. I will pick up only a few of those conditions which are common and which can be managed. That's how the subject is chosen. And among them, one of the conditions is the rotator cuff disease, which is quite frequent. The exact etiology of rotator cuff disease is not known. Either there could be trauma often or without the history of the trauma, the patient may present with that typical presentation of the rotator cuff. Thesis, there are hypotheses, there are two sorts of the hypotheses. Uh, the one of the hypotheses is that there is a impingement as such. Impingement is uh, either the muscles or the other structures are compressed or they are held up between the two firm structures of the bones. And uh, from that point of view, these presentations, clinical presentations are categorized into anterior post superior impingement syndrome, posterior superior impingement syndrome or anterior lateral impingement syndrome. I will come into a bit detail about these in the next asset. Or the other theory is intrinsic where the results occur from a progressive age related degeneration. The extrinsic theory is based upon either a evident trauma where there was a initial history of a huge trauma which might have resulted in dislocation or at times it could be a non-evident trauma that is mild accumulation of the trauma stress patients who function with the shoulder joint due to that occupational factors or other uh, factors which produce a stress on the joint, they may produce the impingement later. So, impingement syndrome is due to external causes. The other way, there could be a degenerative pathology, age-related degeneration of the tendon, which also can present with the shoulder rotator cuff injury. One more theory or one more hypothesis is that the susceptibility to the impingement syndrome or rotator cuff injury also is based upon the shape of the uh, acromion. The acromion shape can be varied and uh, the acromion shape is categorized mainly into three categories. The three shapes primarily based upon that uh, congenital variation. It is a variation, it is not defect as such. Either it could be flat or moderately curved or hooked. The type 3 or hooked conditions, the uh, shape, it predisposes to the rotator cuff injury the chances has the highest chances of uh, the pathology related to the rotator cuff and uh, very interestingly the Indian races particularly South Indians they have a high incidence of these hooker shaped uh, acromions. Acromions in the South Indians is much more frequent than the other way and uh, the risks of uh, developing the rotator cuff syndrome or rotator cuff disease are more common in such. So, this also is another of the hypothesis related to that. As far as what we mean by that, uh, impingement syndromes, the anterior su anterior superior infringement, impingement syndrome is a, a, a important condition, well documented condition for the shoulder pain, which occurs due to the deep surface stress. See, the, if you do the MRI scan, you can see the surface stress in the tendon, subscapular is tendon and that tear may be retracted. So, MRI scan confirms that. Or later on, the same can result in a calcification and there could be some bony structure seen which may be seen in the plain x-ray. So, when a patient presents with the rotator cuff symptoms, a plain x-ray may at times may be negative where you may not be able to see this observation. But if it goes to that later stages where there could be a calcification at the area, that can be seen in the plain x-ray. So, plain x-ray is uh, uh, showing the shoulder in a slightly flexed and internal rotation 
and that at that position you may be able to make out that gap and that uh, the impinged structure becoming calcified whereas the posterior superior impingement is uh, due to the sub supraspinatus tendon which is injured and uh, it enters into the glenoid cavity it penetrates into the glenoid cavity and uh, in such conditions when the shoulder is held at 120 degrees of abduction extended stretched as such or in extreme rotations the labrum moves away from the glenoid that gap between the glenoid and the labrum can be widened so if you palpate at that area clinically you can make out that glenoid rim the edge of the glenoid uh, surface can be filled across the tendon which uh, often is suspected to be due to minor trauma or repeated uh, uh, traumas stress as such mri scan can make out this location easily a plain x-ray can show that gap between the scapula and the shoulder area and that impinged structure at the posterior level can be made out occasionally but quality of plain x-ray should be excellent otherwise it cannot be made out mri scan make out that this uh, impingement of the supraspinatus and the tear in the supraspinatus can be made out as such that's how it is made diagnosed then anterior internal impingement is a bad there could be a symptom of pain which worsens at night and when the harm is raised up and of course the, in this condition a plain x-ray often it will not be making out the diagnosis only when you go for the MRI scan the tear there in the teres muscles group of muscles can be made out and the gap in the anterior side can be also be made out so MRI scan would be necessary the intrinsic hypothesis is a the lesion starts where the load is presumably the greatest depending upon the occupation of the patient and uh, usually it starts at the location long head of the biceps muscle the pain lesion started that and then the tendons would be gradually fibrous and the strength of the tendon tends to be reduced later on can result in stretch from the clinical point of view the major important issue of the clinical presentation in the rotator cuff disease is a uh, the range of movement would be reduced and which is also called as arc syndrome when you ask the patient to stretch the hand up the majority of the patients particularly the posterior impingement and anterior impingement conditions the patient would be would not uh, would feel no pain in the initial 60 degrees of extension but in between 60 to 120 degrees the patient would have either extreme pain or may not, at times it may not be possible to extend beyond that. But beyond 120 degrees, the extension will be based upon the whole rotate shoulder uh, blade movement, the whole shoulder blade moves as such, and hence there will be no pain. This also is called as middle arc syndrome. So this clinical presentation is unique. Patient would have a pain and the pain would be aggravated when the extension occurs. In the extension, in the initial part of the extension there will be no pain then there would be pain in the middle of the arc middle of the extension movement and then again there would be range where if you extend beyond that there would be no pain but in the middle arc painful arc either the patient may not be able to extend by himself or somebody has to support as such and then you have reached the maximum then that pain would be reduced and this is very typical clinical presentation which makes the diagnosis of impingement syndrome easy the MRI scan can confirm that the other clinical observations important clinical observations which make out the diagnosis of these uh, uh, rotator cuff pathologies are uh, which may be seen in a few patients in some others they may not be seen the if you look at the shoulder from the anterior surface the flattened deltoid prominence can be made out which may resemble that of the dislocation but it's not really a dislocation the delta prominence can be reduced it could be one of the symptoms or if you look at the posterior side the winging of the scapula scapula may be winged as such due to the uh, 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 either fibrosis of the subscapularis and teres muscles the, uh, when the patient bends forwards and the shoulder is uh, 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 flexed and uh, uh, brought close to the body adducted during adduction position the scapula would be winged that gap between the uh, scapula and the thoracic cage may be increased 
or if you look at from the side the head of the shoulder seems to be protracted like it's like seems to be bulged right as such wider and it seems to be towards the anterior or the posterior surface so you if you observe the patient from all the three views to a great extent a diagnosis is possible the other tests which are usually done are again to study the range of movements confirm about the possibility of the pain these tests are done and these tests are mainly the aplast test and the yokum test in the aplast test the shoulder is stretched back as such and the with the other hand you just raise the shoulder up or hold the fingers touch the fingers of both hands on the posterior side which gives you that scope of uh, the range of movements that's what we call as aplast scratch test yokum test is the shoulder is extended in front and then the opposite shoulder is touched now if these two tests are positive impingement syndrome or rotator cuff test in injuries can be made up or simply you can study the normal ranges of the movement and see whether the range of movement is reduced or not to confirm about the whether the range of movements are reduced or not the normal range of the movement should be known clearly the normal range of the movement of abduction is around 70 to 180 degrees adduction 30 to 45 degrees flexion 160 to 180 degrees extension 45 these are the conventional basic anatomy which you have studied uh, during anatomy study the normal range of movements if the normal range of movements are reduced then you suspect the rotator cuff pathology if these aplast scratch tests or ear cuff tests are positive that also can help to make the confirm the diagnosis of rotator cuff disease the other tests which we have discussed also are quite critical to make out the diagnosis of rotator cuff lesions then the other tests which also are done are the job test uh, which is again commonly seen if you uh, abduct the shoulder uh, up to 90 degrees and 30 degrees of flexion in the plane and if you as prevent that shoulder elevation if you press the shoulder elevation from the other side examiner will be pressing the shoulder from getting elevated then you can see that the arm is uh, the hand is stretched out and the patient would feel the pain at the area and it's not possible to abduct the shoulder beyond that resistance will produce a pain that also is called as a job test which is done now to confirm the diagnosis of rotator cuff injury also many a times a single set of investigation may not be enough the sensitivity of different set of investigations are lesser and among those the most uh, rather dependable and uh, uh, somewhat you know, most useful and less costly would be ultrasonography ultrasonography of the shoulder can give you the position of that edema and the possible fibrosis of the tendon easily and comparatively it's economical also and accuracy is around 84 to 87 percent mri is considered to be sensitive for 91 percent but the specificity is only 25 percent when i say sensitivity and specificity is a sensitivity is a when the pathologies are observed but not very specific like whether the lesion is exactly same or it produces confusion so mri shows abnormality but it may not be able to confirm uh, the exact nature of the impingement whether it's anterior or posterior and that part that component of the mri is uh, only 20% specific though the identification of the lesions that there is something abnormal is seen in 91% so uh, preference for the investigation should be always ultrasonography which would be economical and it has a high sensitivity as well as a high sorry specificity now there is a typing error sensitivity and specificity the first would be specificity and 84% sensitivity is 87% plain ct the accuracy is very low so ct as uh, and uh, whereas ct arthrography uh, which is a interventional procedure where you inject the dye in with the ct which is again usually is avoided but it gives a 100% accuracy arthroscopy also has accuracy of only 92% plain x ray is also having a relatively high accuracy only in the degenerative disease whereas 
in the real impingement the accuracy is only 12 percent so in the old age patients with the degenerative pathology a plain x-ray can show you a good result whereas in the others it should be the other option of the investigation so when you choose the investigations these also are important issue from the clinical point of view the presentation is categorized into three stages in the first stage there is an edema and hemorrhage which is result from excessive overhead use raising up and seen in the elder patients stage 2 is where the patient would have fibrosis and tendinitis affecting the bursa and the cuff where there would be repeated episodes of inflammation usually in the middle age 25 to 40 stage 3 is where the bone spurs are formed and there could be a complete tear or incomplete tear along the biceps tendon and usually the patients are in the old age stage now treatment for this from iberic point of view my clinical experience i will share only my clinical experience from that point of view uh, like uh, be based upon the clinical issue the symptoms could be or uh, my prescription would be i would be considering this condition as avabhavaka and the description of the avabhavaka as in the text is Amsabesha sthito vayhu shoshaitva amsa bandhanam amsa bandhanam the rotator cuff being dried up or involved sirashtaku chitrasaksa janayati avahakam My approach would be the stage 1 where there would be edema I would consider as amavata and the treatment would be of amavata chikitsa and the usual prescription would be kaishwara murutinja amsarista and maybe if necessary kshara-vasti and the results are quite good, much better than the contemporary approach of the treatment. The stage 2 is where I consider would be Shotha and the book, usually my prescription would be Gokshirati, Punarnamandura, Maharasnath, Bhaka, Matra, Basti. The results are of course uh, dependable but not as good as in the stage 1 conditions. Stage 3 where there would be osteopathy formed, uh, I would consider this as Dhatuksha where my prescription would be Chandra Prabha, Ekangvira, Shogandha Vista and Yapanabhastis. The outcome would be very, uh, not may be very dependable or not very satisfactory, but gives some sort, uh, uh, sort of relief to the patient, though it may not be cured. So, uh, your approach to the treatment can be according to the status and the ironic prescriptions can be modified according to the stage with the, the Doshadusha concept as such and the results also can be made predictable and the treatment can be made dependable. That's uh, my clinical approach in such conditions. Then the next is, uh, the next condition which will relate to the shoulder will be, which we call as a frozen shoulder, a popular word, or adhesive capsulitis. It's a condition where the exact etiology is not known. It's a condition of uncertain etiology, characterized by significant restriction of both active and passive shoulder motion, and that occurs without any obvious intrinsic shoulder disorder. One of the important criteria to make the diagnosis of adhesive capsulitis of frozen shoulder is absence of the radiological signs of uh, uh, the degeneration of the bone. So, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons defines the condition as a condition of varying severity characteristic of gradual development of limitation of active and passive shoulder motion where radiographic findings other than osteopenia are absent. There are no other signs except the calcium in content in the bone may be reduced. Other than that, there will be no radiological sign. No other bony pathology is seen. Now, from the clinical, it is a gradually progressive disease and the stages are usually considered as the freezing stages, frozen stages and thawing stages. The freezing stage would be quite painful during initial symptom would be a pain in the shoulder and most of the times pain aggravates during the night and it takes a long time, varies, uh, majority, majority of these patients, the symptom lasts for around 9 months, in, at times it could be more or lesser, <coughs> for a long time the patient may have initially tolerable but later severe pain gradually that could be increasing. Then there would be stiff on the shoulder. The next stage would be patient may have a situation where the joint would be stiff as it, which lasts around 4 months or to 20 months. Then there would be thawing where the shoulder is completely frozen. That's what we call as a, uh, that where the time would be around 5 to 6, 26 months. 
Incidence of Dethysyl capsulitis is quite common in diabetes patients and uh, um, any times patients have adhesive capsulitis, you need to go for investigation. If the patient is not already diagnosed for diabetes, you may diagnose the patients of diabetes mellitus based upon the clue. So many times it happens like this, patients are non, not known to be diabetic, patient may present with the shoulder uh, capsulitis symptoms and then you suggest the blood sugar investigations, you may make the diagnosis of uh, diabetes mellitus. In such patients, diabetic, particularly diabetic patients, it also involves the other joint, the shoulder joint. Both the shoulder joints tend to get involved, which may take around 6 months to 7 years after the initial symptom. Then there is another uh, issue is uh, what we call as a secondary frozen shoulder, where the causes are uh, identified. Among the other different causes, known causes, diabetes is one of the causes most in important disease. It is known that diabetic patients are five times more likely to develop adhesive capsulates compared with non-diabetic controls. The other disease conditions which can produce the frozen shoulder symptoms are the trauma, particularly if the patient has undergone a shoulder surgery earlier, history of rotator cuff tear or fracture of the proximal humerus earlier or if the patient was bedridden for a long duration either of cardiac surgery or neurosurgery. Endocrine pathologies like thyroid diseases, autoimmune diseases, hyperlipidemia also are known to trigger the capsulitis. History of stroke or Parkinson's disease also are known to trigger the frozen shoulder conditions. Cardiac diseases also are known to produce these. Drugs like uh, retrovirals, antiretrovirals, immunizations, fluoroquinolines also are known to trigger that. Malignancy also is known to trigger the uh, shoulder uh, the pain or frozen shoulder symptoms. So, any patient comes to you as with the frozen shoulder, it is quite important to rule out any of these underlying pathology. The typical clinical presentation of a frozen shoulder is a, a slow onset of the shoulder pain, which is localized discomfort at the deltoid insertion. Initially, it is only at the deltoid insertion. The, Initial most symptom will be inability to sleep on the affected side and the pain will be more at night, rapidly body pain with the sleep deprivation. And uh, gradually it results in restricted glenohumeral elevation, patient would not be able to raise the shoulder up and external rotation also may be the other feature. And one of the other characteristics is radiological investigations would be negative when there are no other evidences that is considered as a frozen shoulder as such. From the standard protocol of the treatment, I am not talking about IV treatment, the contemporary medical treatment is once the uh, adhesive capsulite is diagnosed, the standard protocol of the treatment would be a course of prednisolone or steroids, then a course of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and uh, the other is a subarticular injection, intraarticular injection in the glenohumeral area of a long acting steroids or physical therapy, physiotherapy is like where the range of movement exercises are done or at times it could be a, like a physician recommended home therapy. These are the possible options as such. But from our clinical point of view, the I would consider this as a the Vishwati, Talapratengalanamya, the the movement of the shoulder is reduced, that is called as Vishwati. Of course, many times Vishwati is uh, interpreted as a, a pain continuously. Anyway, that issue is uh, something different, where you may have some difference of opinion later. But uh, the uh, patients with the adhesive capsulitis in the early stages, they respond satisfactorily or rather many times they respond much better than the conventional standard protocol of treatment like steroids with the Gokshurati, Vishnu Stute, Ashwagandharist and Dashamula Nirohovisti. The only issue is the treatment has to be very prolonged. The upper limit of the duration of the treatment cannot be de defined. It may be to months to years in many patients. So that is in brief about the shoulder joint. And as I am supposed to talk about the neck joints also, I will be taking up a few important issues related to the neck joints, the cervical spines. Among the cervical spines in conditions, the pathology is related to the cervical spine. The first of the thing is the cervical spine injury. 
the, with the cervical spine injury, again I will not go into maximum detail, only minimum, just uh, a, a outward look of these conditions. Uh, about 7% of the patients who have met with a vehicle accident and are unconscious or have from fallen from the height would have involvement of the cervical spine. Now this is from the emergency medicine point of view. Patient brought to you in an unconscious condition with a history of trauma. Uh, to identify the di different uh, lesions would be quite difficult. You may miss the conditions. You will be uh, your attention will be at only at the central nervous system, brain and other structures and hence uh, these injuries often are missed. So you need to consider this fact like uh, about 70%, 7% of the patients would have a cervical spine injury and about one third of these occur at a C2 level, at the high level. Now this also is important, a injury at the higher level of the cervical spine would have very critical outcome and particularly at the craniocerebral junction, that is the atlas and axis, the first and second vertebral body, it can be acutely fatal as in hanging. Hanging is a procedure where the uh, sudden death is produced by producing a dislocation of the uh, atlantaxial joint. And cervical spine injuries cause around, it is quite frequent, around 6,000 deaths and 5,000 new cases of quadriplegia every year. So either it may produce a huge morbidity or a significant mortality and it is one of the significant condition. Whenever a patient of a suspected cervical spine injury comes in, the most important precaution you have to take is that you have to immobilize the patient. Do not mobilize the patient unnecessarily in the name of examination and so on. So clinical examination protocols of course we will be discussing with. But all that important is the patient should be immobilized or patient has to be moved from the site of injury to a facility where the, uh, this treatment is available and handling of this suspected cervical injury itself is a specialized job. It needs a special care. A large number of patients would have more harm uh, than really the initial trauma due to the uh, uncontrolled movements during the shift of the patient and hence shifting you need to either have a sophisticated uh, stretcher or improvise a stretcher where the movements of the head are reduced and if wherever there is a possible make use of a, 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 a this traction uh, where a, you make use of any instrument to give a traction ensure that the neck is stretched, neck is extended so that the further complication of the injury to the spinal cord or the spinal nerve root is minimized before you go for the detailed investigation. Investigations, radiological, suppose a patient is stable and uh, you have a facility for the investigations, a, the radiological investigations of cervical spine also require multiple views because a single view or simple conventional one or two views would not be possible in a uh, uh, to make out in a usual view. Though lateral view of cervical spine is considered to be the most critical important view where 85 to 90 percent of the spine injuries can be made out in the lateral view. But the other views which are done are lateral swimmer's position and the oblique or odontite position or anterior posterior position. The x-rays are done as in this shown the uh, lateral as usual where the x-ray is done and the odontide is where the mouth is kept open and it is quite important to make out this uh, issue. So, uh, swimmer's position is uh, the, the x-ray is made to pass through the neck from a side as such. Uh, the patient is uh, made to lie down and this is swimmer's position. Then anterior posterior of course as usual conventional these are the positions of the x-rays which are required. So if you are taking the x-ray in a suspected cervical spine injury these views are necessary. Now from again gross, I will not go into much detail, the injuries to the spinal cord are categorized into hyperflexion or hyperextension or vertical compression or lateral flexion and others. Uh, others are where these cannot be defined. So identification would be based upon the abnormality which you see and type of the uh, injury trauma. And it could be again categorized based upon the stability like either hyperflexion with the sprain, simple injury 
or bilateral interfacial dislocation, where there is a dislocation as such, or simple wedge fracture, and so on. I think uh, that much of a detail may not be necessary. What I mean by this are hyperplexion or sprain injuries, where you will have an anterior subluxation when the posterior ligaments are ruptured, as you see over here in this image. See, simple wedge fracture with the stable injury where there would be a slight wedge fracture, oblique fracture, unstable wedge fracture where both these two are put together and uh, unilateral interfacial dislocation where the fascia has become ruptured and there is a slight dislocation, axis of the spinal cord is altered. A bilateral interfacial dislocation where the spinal axis is almost uh, damaged and uh, the hemisection, re near hemisection has occurred and teardrop sign is uh, where there is a bulging of uh, the, menis, uh, the uh, meninges as such and there is a compression of the spinal cord. So that is how they are made out with the scans as such, MRI scan is necessary. The uh, extension injuries are either what we call as hangman's fracture where there would be a complete fracture at the spine level or extension teardrop where the same teardrops uh, damage, the spinal cord would be compressed due to the extension or hyperextension with the spondylosis, there could be a spondylosis precipitated, the axis can be displaced, this could be considered, it is also called as open mouth fracture. So that is about the detailed classification which may not be necessary in the routine conditions. The clinical presentation important are in general in all the patients who have a sp uh, suspected spinal cord injury, particularly a cervical spine injuries. The patient would have pain in the neck, uh, particularly which enhances on the palpation over the uh, spinous process of posterior neck pain and the limited range of movements of motion, the range of movement of the neck are limited, but precaution is uh, never try to do that movement, uh, attempt to do the movement unless you are confirmed about the possibility of uh, a compression of the nerve root or spinal injury or a patient who has a weakness or numbness or paresthesia along the affected nerve roots. These are the common clinical symptoms. In addition to that, a patient of spinal injury would also have an injury to the nervous system, either spinal cord or the nerve roots and based upon that, the clinical symptoms also can vary. Either there could be a spinal shock, a gross injury of the spinal cord can produce a spinal shock where the patient may have a praxidity below the level of the region Reflexes may be absent, there could be loss of renal and bladder sphincter, fecal incontinence or at times it could be erection of persistent erection of the penis, free epism could occur or the patient may have an absence of a bulbocavernous reflex, swallowing also could be affected in such conditions or there could be a neurogenic shock also due to the pain, the patient may have hypotension, paradoxical bradycardia, flush, dry, warm peripheral skin which is sign of a shock or there could be autonomic dysfunction ileus, uh, paralytic ileus, urinary retention or there could be abnormal thermal sensation. Uh, some areas of the body would be hot and some areas would be cold. So that is a, a presence of the abnormal thermal reactions. So a patient of a spinal injury may have any of these symptoms or all of these symptoms and uh, a thorough clinical examination and investigations are absolutely essential in such conditions. That is the clinical presentation. Complications produced due to the cervical ligament damage could be quite huge. Either it could be simple pain at the area, or there could be muscle spasm, autonomic nervous dysfunction, brainstem ischemia, cerebellar ischemia, or brain, posterior brain ischemia, and uh, autonomic pathology could occur depending upon the different levels or severity of the injury. I will not go into much detail about that. The classification and grading is quite of the important issue in case of the spinal injuries. Spinal injuries, the National Emergency X-ray Diagraphy Utilization Study or NEXUS criteria would be making the diagnosis and the principles of assessment. If there is no posterior midline cervical spine tenderness or if there is no evidence of intoxication or if the patient is a normal alert and no neurological deficit is seen, the, if the patient is alert and stable, in that condition patient can be discharged and there is no need of uh, any treatment. But conventionally people would prescribe 
a, a high dose of prednisolone in all the patients uh, for cervicals when this has become a conventional practice now but it's a controversial so a safety of the patient is based upon these five signs where there is no midline tenderness no evidence of intoxication and the patient is alert normal and no focal neurological deficit patient is alert and stable the immediate surgical intervention primary surgical indication intervention could be necessary if there is a pathology of cervical injuries presented with malalignment of the spine with or without neurological deficit alignment of the spine is altered seen with the x-rays or clinically or progressive neurological deterioration uh, in the face of persistent compression if there is a compression of the bone or disc fragments and the con condition is progressive that also requires immediate surgery the other way of assessing the patients of spinal injury would be there is another method of assessing the cervical injuries spine injuries by a typical score cervical spine injury severity score and it's again based upon the five important characteristics like uh, studying the shape of or uh, morphology of the injury with the CT or MRI scan then integrity of the disc ligament complex again based upon the MRI scan and the neurological status assessed clinically like if there is an evidence of nerve injuries or so on you can give a score if there is a visible sign of compression score is 1 if there is a burst fracture 2 distraction or translation then 3 and 4 if the disco ligament complex disc and ligaments are intact then 0 if there is a mild injury uh, then 1 if there is a complete disruption 2 neurological status if the patient is uh, uh, having no neurological signs uh, uh, is 0 score and by this score prediction of the prognosis can be made out if the score is above 5, the outcome is extremely poor and uh, the patient requires an uh, acute life support care and outcome would be poor. This is how the prediction of prognosis is made in case of the spinal injury. Now suppose you have ruled out all such conditions of surgical indications and acute serious complications. In such other conditions to prevent the complications or prevent the later delayed complications, the usual management is simply stretching out the neck and immobilizing the neck in a stretched out position, extended position. You have different sorts of the collars available with the minimum immobilization. Neck collars, are different sorts are now available, soft collars or hard collars are available and any of these collars could be used. Sushruta has used a technique of that extends and the principle is remaining the same. Important is in a patient of uh, cervical spine injury, the prescription according to Sushruta is uh, you have to stretch the neck by holding at the chin and the occiput bone, Grivayam, Vivirtayam, Pravishtayam, Adhoviva, uh, all different degrees of extension and flexion injuries are described like uh, Vivirtha, Pravi, Adho Pravishta uh, uh, in such conditions. Avata Vasahanosha Pragusya Unamayatnaram Pratakusham Samam Dakva Vasapathenam Estate Uttanam Chayatyanam Sakharatram Atanditaha a kusha or a support is given at around the neck. Now, of course, you have a ready-made collars available which can be used and the patient has been nursed in a uh, supine position as such. The guidelines for the spinal injury now, the ACS trauma quality program guidelines which are quite important now are the spinal motion restriction devices, the same as I told different sorts of the collars. They can be used to uh, are uh, they used whenever that is indicated and it should be applied to the whole spine it's not only the cervical spine as well. cervical collars can be discontinued once you have started with that the cervical collar can be discontinued if uh, without additional radiographic imaging in an awake asymptomatic adult patient with normal neurological examination no high risk injury mechanisms so that risk assessment score would be lesser and if there is a free range of cervical motion and no neck tenderness, in only that condition the collar could be avoided, otherwise the collar has to be continued. Then plain radiographs of the cervical and cervical lumbar spine are not recommended in initial screening, whereas a multi-detector CT is the initial imaging study. The CT or MRI is the initial study and uh, CT is better than MRI as per the guidelines. 
that's about the cervical spine injuries then the next condition from the other non traumatic conditions is the spondylosis one of the common conditions very common incident cervical spondylosis is defined as a, a chronic degenerative condition of the cervical spine that affects the vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs of the neck radiological findings based upon the uh, radiological findings 90% of men older than 50 years and 90% of women older than 60 years have an evidence of degenerative changes in the cervical spine this is about the latest statistics presented in 2021 throughout the globe so many of the patients may have a spondylosis without presenting a clinical symptom or many times those clinical symptoms are often not considered as a severe patient just live with that symptoms and they may not complain about that the pathological changes which occur would be the initial changes would be in the intervertebral discs they will be losing their hydration and the elasticity the first of the changes generally during the degeneration then gradually there will be fissure and cracks develop in this disc area then the ligaments around they become inelastic less elastic during that said the patient would have a rigidity then there will be spurs the bony changes may occur the bone projections may occur disc bulges out the initially it disc the space between the disc increases and it bulges out which again reduction reduces the range of movement and then the disc may get herniated may projected it and that projected disc or uh, herniated disc would be producing a compression of either the spinal cord or there could be spinal nerve roots spinal nerve roots could be compressed either due to the projected disc or due to hypertrophy of the facet joints the facet joints they may become hypertrophied and fibrosed and that also can produce the nerve root compression so ultimately you have the last stage where either the spinal cord is compressed or the spinal nerve root is compressed initially the pathology starts with the intervertebral disc then progresses and whole process of this is called as spondylosis lesion of course often the people use the word spondylitis also but as technically spondylitis is related to only the inflammatory conditions which are in the initial stages the presentation clinical presentation of the spondylosis is again detailed as it the it starts with the usually in the elderly patient is a accumulation of degenerative changes uh, commonly seen in the elderly patients and uh, uh, usually patients uh, uh, below younger 40 only 20% have degenerative disc stresses disc lesions and only 4% of foramenal stenosis that where the nerve is compressed which is confirmed by mri as persons older than 40 years almost 60% would have a degenerative disc lesis and only 20% would have uh, the foramenal stenosis or spinal nerve injuries nerve damage would occur so there would be the clinical presentation varies according to the stage or the age in which the patient presents at trauma the role of trauma is controversial whether really there is a history of trauma or not controversial but the the popular theory is there is a, a repetitive subclinical trauma which is like carrying heavy objects or so on are supposed to be the other causes work activity is known to be presented or very clean uh, frequently known to be uh, the cause for the uh, spondylosis is significantly higher in patients who carry the loads on their head but now you have another set of the patients who use system quite frequently like software people also have spondylosis risk quite high because the neck is held in a single position and the range of movement is not given freely there is a role of genetics in the cervical spine also is controversial some people have some evidence people claim that there are evidences of genetic pathology but the exact nature of the gene is not known as far as uh, the clinical assessment radiological assessment of spondylosis by x rays which is again is quite difficult the rather you have to have a very meticulous approach to study the x ray to confirm the spondylosis and the standard protocols would be to assess the different angles in the lateral radiography x lateral x ray you have to study the tangential action uh, activities tangential axis the is, uh, the first is the cob method cob method is uh, 
where you draw the tangents, the vertical tangent and then the oblique tangent, lateral, uh, error, the angle is assessed. If the angle is more than 25 degrees, that is suggestive of a spondylosis method. Or the other way is a, a posterior tangent method, where you draw a straight line from the C2 to C7 and the measurement of the cross-sectional area. That area studied if it is more than 2 cm at C2 level, that also is suggestive of the pathology. Or if the nuchal ligaments are ossified, you can see the ossification of nuchal ligaments as such. And the neural foramen, cervical neural foramen can be measured, size can be measured. And if it is reduced to less than 1.5 cm, that also is considered as a, a sign of spondylitis. A spondylitis can be better measured as it has graded with the CT scan and usually the CT scan would grade it into uh, the three categories, three grades as such, where subarachnoid space obliteration is seen in the grade 1 and in the grade 3 you will see a, a significant spinal cord signal change, the spinal cord changes would occur uh, and contrast is uh, enhanced. This is how the standard grading is done in MRI image. MRI images should be again studied very carefully in case of the cervical spine pathology to understand these disease phenomena. I will not go into huge detail about that. A vertical as well as horizontal views are necessary to confirm the most important issues are to confirm the diameter of the spinal canal as well as whether the facet joint spaces to rule out the nerve compression are the most critical issues. Uh, as per the uh, your pract uh, this radiological practice, imaging practices, myelography is considered to be more accurate to confirm about the possibility of disc herniation. The gap between the disc can be made out. And, uh, but myelography is a, a interventional procedure, may not be done in routine condition. So, CTA myelography is always more reliable to confirm the diagnosis. As far as the clinical presentation is concerned, the clinical presentation would be of different degrees. The most common clinical symptom would be a cervical pain and the cervical pain may be presented in different manners. The, some of the patients may have a suboccipital headache, headache in the posterior side and uh, it may be due to either nerve compression or degenerative disc conditions or pain may be perceived at the exactly the same site or it may be radiated to the shoulder or towards the posterior side or scapula or arm. Usually pain is worse in certain specific position and it also can interfere with the sleep. The pain in the cervical area and the patient often can say that the pain is worse in certain specific position. If the patient has a compression of the nerve root that is radiculopathy, then that results which also can result in uh, lead to ischemic changes in the sensory, uh, there could be abnormality of the sensory functions or there could be abnormality of the motor functions like weakness or there could be radiating pain over the area. And uh, radiculopathy often is seen in the older ages, later part of life, half 40 to 50 years and acute herniated disc can present the symptom suddenly. There could be a sudden onset of the pain or sudden aggravation of the pain in such conditions. And C6 nerve root is uh, most commonly affected because of the predominant degeneration in the C5 C6 interface. Majority of the patients would have that degeneration in the C5 C6 interface. Myelopathy, where the spinal cord is damaged and the spinal cord is affected, it can present with more serious consequences and conditions. And again, onset could be gradual, insidious, and uh, which again becomes more common prominent in the later half of the life where the patient would have impairment of the sphincters as well as the neurological deficits that by pronouns at times it even can result in a quadriplegia as such. From the uh, myelopathy conditions they are again categorized into five uh, categories. Transverse lesion syndromes where the patient may have involvement of the specific corticospinal tra tracts as such. Again, I will not go into the detail of clinical presentation there because the time is actually we have passed the time limit. It can present with the motor syndromes uh, due to the uh, involvement of uh, the corticospinal horn cells. The patient may have the motor functions impaired at the specific zones as such, or the patient may have a central cord syndrome where motor and sensory involvement is uh, 
more the upper extremities than the lower extremities or it's a brown sequard syndrome where there will be unilateral cord lesion with the exilateral cortical spinal tract involvement this again brown sequard syndrome also is a very unique presentation where the patient may have a impaired thermal sensation on one side and uh, the loss of uh, pain sensation on one side and other side there could be loss of motor activity uh, which is a very typical condition and uh, the brachial neuralgia or compression of the nerves also can occur in myelopathy conditions that's how the myelopathy is made out other rare presentations could be there could be a numbness in the hands glove like sensation or sp tandem spinal stenosis with the cervical lumbar stenosis both lumbar as well as cervical lesions together uh, is the presenting neurological claudication gait abnormality and uh, the bo both lower and motor neuron signs could be presented dysphagia is a rare condition or vertebral basilar insufficiency or vertigo may be seen in a few of the patients as a clinical presentation the important clinical tests which are usually done to confirm the spondylosis are the spurling sign where the patient's neck is extended towards and bended bent towards side lateral side which produces a pain in the radicals the radiating pain could be confirmed or the met sign where the when the patient's neck is flexed the patient will feel a generalized shock like electric shock like condition half main sign is when the uh, cut, uh, middle finger is nicked like if you just uh, pinch the middle finger the thumb and uh, the index finger they would show a flexor response there will be reflex contraction they will be contracted this also is a sign to confirm the radiculopathy these are the commonly used clinical methods the other symptoms of spondylosis which are quite significant are distal weakness decreased range of movements in the cervical spine a clumsiness of the hand movements patient often patients say that they cannot hold or they cannot do fine jobs as such loss of sensation in the hands reflexes could be exaggerated in certain of the patients and uh, gait may be altered or extensive of plantar reflex uh, as upgoing two nail reflexes could be seen in severe myelopathy any of these symptoms or all of the symptoms would occur the primary treatment in case of the spondylosis are neck immobilization for neck immobilization again there are different sorts of the mm -hmm. instruments now used uh, now uh, which of the instrument would be more superior than others that's not the important issue you may have different sorts of the instruments the best of the thing convenient would be simple soft collar then the other instruments are often used another the another of the treatment which is usually done by the conventional medical practice is a uh, epidural injections uh, so that the patient would not have the pain where the concerned nerves would be desensitized with the epidural injection from ayurvedic point of view i would consider this as a common clinical sign of the vata vyadi mentioned where grivayasta kundanam that uh, important pain uh, presentation as uh, the sign of uh, the vata vyadi and uh, as far as the prescription is concerned i would be preferring the prescription of uh, gokshrabi bishamsya and avipatika churna with the tailadhara and dashamula nirohasti in radiculopathy and the results are quite reliable you may have much more satisfactory results than the other way but if the patient has developed myelopathy then i would consider this as a nagarana janya matra vyadi and i would be prescribing chandra prabhaya kamira prabhas mayitra tapyadi and yapanagasti outcome may not be very satisfactory but patient would have a significant relief in such conditions uh, and the medical issues complications which can occur in a patient of cervical spondylosis could be that myelopathy paraplegia tetraplegia recurrent chest infections pressure sores recurrent urinary tract infections also could be produced in a patient of spondylitis and these conditions may have to be treated with the, the specific target approach treatment as such that's about as such surgical intervention may be necessary if the patient has a progressive neurological deficit or there is a definite comp compression of the cervical nerve root and if the pain is very severe surgical treatment may be necessary but even the outcome of surgery also is not so good and with this we will conclude though i have not dealt with all the conditions at least a few of the important conditions related to the joints are discussed and uh, the points will be the important points which we have to know are 
the shoulder and neck grind conditions require meticulous evaluation. The clinical evaluation is quite important and the approach also should be graded. You cannot have a general principle or general single line of treatment for all the diseases and the condition has to be, treatment has to be assessed. If you do that meticulous graded approach, ayurvedic treatment protocols have a significant impact on the clinical outcome. With this, let me conclude. Now, if there are any questions, I will try to answer and then by up. Thank you. I think there are some questions. Uh, management, there is one question like... Uh, sir, can I read it for you, sir? Okay, I am just going through that. Okay, what should okay. we do in case of malunion of fractured clavicle bone? See, malunion, it requires surgery. Malunion of clavicle, the treatment would be surgery as such. Then what should we do in case of malunion? The, when, what is the prognosis of canal stenosis at cervical level? What should be our approach to management? I think I have clarified. If there is an obvious canal stenosis, the treatment is surgery. But the surgical outcome also is not so good, not so satisfactory. It often is poor. So the choice is left to the patients. When a patient comes to me, I would always say, I'll give the choice to the patient. If the patient prefers surgery, that's fine. If not, the, you will have to manage the conditions. Uh, medically and my prescription would be in a, a, a spinal canal stenosis I would consider this Marga or the Nivata Prokopa and what I have suggested like the prescription like Chandra Prabhaya, Kangvira, Abhrakavasma, Tapyadi with the Yabana Bastis. That's what I generally use in my treatment, in my practice as such. Then um, the spinal injury Ayurvedic management. I think I have clarified if the spinal injury has a high score in the high risk conditions that a life support is required, uh, there is a very limited scope for aerobic management. So initial conditions when the patient presents with the spinal shock stage, which I have clarified, uh, virtually there is not much of a scope. But later in the later conditions, definitely yes, we can produce some changes. But in all the conditions, if there is a neurological deficit, like a quadriplegia, paraplegia, the outcome would be poor, but still with the, the same line of treatment of uh, either Adharanga Vata or Vata Bayadi, you can produce some changes in the outcome. Then when the patient went through surgery related to the spine, how much time would be, can I, I think, I do not say that how much time as specifically the time, but uh, in the patients after surgery, uh, within maybe one or two months, we can start our treatment. See, once the wound is healed and the bone is stabilized, the basic treatment of uh, the surgery in cervical spine is to fix the bones, the bone stabilization. Once the bone is stabilized uh, with the different techniques, now surgical techniques also are different. When you put an implant, the time taken for the bone stabilization would be more and uh, if it is only a, mm, arthrodesis created, it may be lesser. So once the bone is stabilized, we can start our treatment. Then what causes wasting of supraspinatus in the treatment? As I told you, the impingement, the nerves when they are compressed, that results in the wasting of the muscles. So when the muscles are wasted, that confirms that uh, the, uh, uh, there is a uh, nerve compression. So wasting of the muscle is a sign there. Then, uh, the, uh, then what should be the approach to manage Aorist paralysis palsy in brachial nerve damage. Okay, now that's a different issue. Brachial nerve damage due to the aorist palsy is due to the compression there. And uh, uh, my usual prescription would be Gokshanadi, Google, Ekamavira, and Ashwagandhari. So, we are the patients who respond to that as such. Aorist palsy can be somewhat better managed with our ayurvedic treatment protocol than the contemporary. In the contemporary surgical, in this medical approach, uh, the outcome is not very satisfactory uh, as such. Mm, that's uh, uh, cervical research palsy is a brachial nerve injury. So it's not under the category of the shoulder uh, disease, joint disease. So I have not referred to that part in the present presentation as such. Okay, fine. Are there any more questions? I think there are no more questions. Ah, uh, any more questions from the participants? If you have any questions, you may unmute yourself and also ask. There is some question like in shoulder ligament. Tear, treatment, yeah. treatment of I think, shoulder. I think I have clarified. If the shoulder ligament tear, 
it results in which ligament that again depends upon which ligament i think uh, i have discussed that somewhat in detail mm, uh, the you the management would be according to that specific injury see that there are two approaches in the shoulder injury there are two approaches uh, the other older conventional approach is uh, in the shoulder injuries you try the convent this uh, conservative treatment first and if the patient has a recurrent dislocation go for surgery whereas the current approach the current generation of orthopedicians prefer the other way they prefer a surgical treatment in the beginning and mri scan i think that part i have clarified to a certain extent uh, that's the there is a sort of controversy in that issue uh, but i think that older approach is more preferable than the current approach then uh, what is the ayurvedic treatment for shoulder ligament injury after surgery if there is no relief so if the surgery has failed to produce a relief uh, then you have to evaluate the i i won't say that there is a very specific condition or protocol of the treatment you have to evaluate most of the times the um, failure or the patient continue to have the pain after the surgery as i have seen in many of the patients would be due to the edema in the tendons and the ligaments ligaments become edematous or fibrous so in such conditions patients would uh, better respond would to maharasnadi kwata that's what i usually prescribe with gokshala gugul gokshala gugul and maharasnadi kwata in that condition that there is a edema in the tendons but if the surgery has produced some other complications like uh, a damage to the nerves or the bones are not united then the whole issue would be more complex so i think uh, uh, answer to that question would be case specific so it may not be possible to uh, give a generalized uh, statement huh? then management of cystic lesion in shoulder joint that cystic lesion is suggestive of a degenerative pathology of the cartilages and the ligaments so in that condition usually my prescription would be gokshara gopal purana mandura and maharashtra gopal shotha shotha chikitsa that's the usual prescription and patients would respond somewhat satisfactorily mm -hmm. then uh, okay fine there are some say thanks right any more questions any more questions from the participants fine okay if there are no questions we'll wind up yes sir Thank you so much for uh, elaborately explaining uh, different uh, neck and uh, shoulder pathologies and its management. Uh, it's indeed a privilege and uh, honor for uh, having you with us today, sir. Thank you so much. And on behalf of uh, Dr. Jasul and Ayurveda Map, also I thank you once again. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, also, we look forward to have further more sessions with you uh, in the upcoming yeah. classes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you and also participants thank you so much for joining today uh, see you all in the next session of uh, superva uh, until then signing off dhanyawad